Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's QC COVID-19 press briefing. It is Thursday, August 27th. Today we have Ed Rivers with the Scott County Health Department, Nita Ludwig with the Rock Island County Health Department, and today we're joined by Chris McCormick Priest, who is with Vera French Community Mental Health Center. Um, all of the speakers will have some prepared statements that they'll provide. Following that, we encourage any of our media partners to type any questions that you have for the participants into the chat. I will moderate those at the end. Um, if your question is for one of our participants in particular, please go ahead and list their name in there so we can um, connect those accordingly. Um, but we will go ahead and get started. Nita, can you please start us off with your case numbers as well as any other information you would like to share this today? Sure. Today, we are saddened to report that another person has passed away from COVID-19. It was a man in his 80s who had been living in a long-term care facility. And as we all know, those are one of our most vulnerable populations. So please do your part by helping to slow the spread of these infections by wearing your mask, keeping at least six, six feet of distance between yourself and others, and washing your hands frequently. In addition, we also have 17 new COVID-19 cases in Rock Island County, um, bringing our total now to 2,123, and currently 13 patients are hospitalized in Rock Island County. Uh, we wanted to share a little bit about the masks that are now mandated in Illinois, including in restaurants. Masks are required in all Illinois establishments, and in addition, the governor's office updated its policy Wednesday for restaurants and bars because of rapidly rising cases all over Illinois. And they are required, so this is not encouraged or suggested, it is mandatory in Illinois. Patrons must wear masks during any interaction with wait staff, food service workers, and other employees at both indoor and outdoor dining bar and restaurants. Face coverings must be worn over the mouth and nose when patrons are approached and served by staff, including but not limited to when employees uh, take patrons' orders, deliver food and beverages, and service tables. And patrons are currently required to wear a mask whenever on the premises except while eating or drinking at the table or bar. The new guidelines ensure that while seated, interactions between business staff and patrons can happen safely, to, and certainly to prevent the possible spread of the virus. Service staff also are required to wear masks. The Governor's Restore Illinois plan allows for the state's 11 regions to move backward into tiers if necessary. Two regions already have, including near St. Louis, and Will County and Kankakee counties in the Chicago suburb, suburban area. Some of these restrictions include closing bars and restaurants at 11 p.m. with no indoor dining or bar service. All patrons have to be seated at tables outside. No ordering, seating, or congregating at the bar. The bar stools would need to be removed. No standing or congregating indoors or outdoors while waiting for a table or exiting, no dancing or standing indoors, and reservations would be required for each party, and no seating of multiple partners at one table. So we are in region two in our county. Besides the Illinois Quad Cities, that includes Peoria, Bloomington Normal, LaSalle, and LaSalle, Peru. All of these counties are seeing rapidly rising case counts. These mitigation efforts could happen here. Rock Island County has also been dangerously close to warning status for the last three weeks. Our positivity rate did drop last week, but the preceding two weeks, it was at 7.5%, and 8% is the warning level. So we have been bracing for that warning status if it does come our way. Staff are updated on the Illinois Department of Public Health website every Friday. However, Rock Island County alone going into a warning status would not necessarily put the whole region into those mitigation me measures that I just mentioned. But if enough counties within our region go into warning status, then the region could go into these restrictions the same as Region 4 and Region 7 in Illinois already have. Thank you.
in Scott County today, uh, the case count stands at 2,094. Our number of deaths remain at 19. In a recent conversation with our medical director about current COVID-19 cases, his initial statement was, good news, bad news. The good news is that Scott County is not at the level of COVID-19 cases during the peak of our surge in July. The bad news is that after a decline from that peak of 30 cases a day, we've reached a plateau. We now see an average of 20 positive COVID-19 cases daily. From these cases, there are a number of close contacts who must also quarantine. These types of numbers continue to affect so many sectors of our community, from hospitals to retail establishments to schools. These establishments have been forced to pivot as they are at the mercy of our inability to contain the spread of this virus. At this point, the planning efforts of our school districts have been forced to put priority on safety instead of academics. Children are walking into schools with masks, fewer numbers of classmates on various days, and using their arms to help them measure six feet of distance if they're walking into school at all. As adults, it's been difficult to maneuver the continuously changing landscape over the last six months. For children, we can assume that the difficulty has been significantly compounded. Today, we're joined by Chris mccormick Priest from Vera French Community Mental Health Center. As an advocate for supporting the social and emotional well-being of children, we welcome her advice on how to best help our kids as they navigate COVID-19 school and all the challenges they bring. Well, Ed, you've hit the nail on the head with a couple of things. Uh, continuously changing landscape uh, every day brings us different information and different numbers. So it's important as we think about kind of what's happening that we recognize it has been a difficult year. Um, COVID-19 has certainly brought to the forefront a very different way of looking at school. You know, a year ago, we were taking pictures of our kids on the front porch or as they walked into school and uh, they were excitedly participating in the new school year. And this is has this is changed. Everything is happening very quickly. And uh, I think not being able to plan for the unknown is pretty stressful, both for kids and for parents, as well as for teachers, school districts, and anyone impacted by what's happening in our current situation. The most important takeaway I want people to come from this press conference with today, however, is to remember that children take their cue from adults. Anxiety and fear are very contagious. So before we talk about some, some tips to help kids and some ways to navigate through this uncertainty, I wanna remind people of a couple of things and I want us to be thinking about where we stand as adults and what we need to do. You know, in general, we fool ourselves into thinking that life is certain and we can predict everything that's gonna happen. Certainly in some ways, we know what tomorrow will bring, but for the most part, what we've learned is that we can't control the future. We can't control what's happening right now. The best gift we can give our children is learning how to address and manage uncertainty ourselves. Uncertainty is a fact, and it is at this point in time the norm and not the exception. This is both scary as well as empowering, but we can learn some ways to build tolerance and to help kids build tolerance. So first of all, I would say to adults, parents, grandparents, others who are with children, be mindful of your words and your behavior. I think talking about things in a frightened, fearful, um, dramatic way only creates that situation with kids and it's hard to calm them once they are, are wound up like that. It is important to remember that avoiding life's adventures or life's adversities is not a healthy way to build tolerance and resilience. But I would suggest that we be very careful and unplug from some of the things that are happening around us. 
having a television on, having a radio on, saying things over and over and over again, same loop only serves to reinforce fear in people. So it's important to remember how many times do we have to watch something or listen to something before we feel overwhelmed by it. Focus on what you can control. Where and how you spend your time. What are your thoughts? What is your conversation? Practice some breathing exercises to calm yourself and teach kids how to do this. They're very receptive to learning this. Think about your daily routine and what you're going to do. And this includes all the mitigation strategies that we've just talked about. Listen to your own talk when you are talking with other adults or when you're talking with kids. Listen to how you talk about and frame uncertainty. Will self-awareness help you catch yourself saying things that are not very productive? I think so. So I think we do have to be self-aware. Let's talk a little bit about some specific things that will be helpful to kids. I posed this um, information in a couple of questions. And the first question I asked myself was, will talking about coronavirus make my child more anxious? And I wanna tell you, no, it will not. They know it's there, they've heard things about it, they need information about it. But I think it's important as we talk to kids about coronavirus, to be grounded and to be clear about how you're managing your own anxiety when you begin the conversation. Obviously, listening to press conferences, educating yourself on what is and isn't dangerous, and understanding how to, how to handle uncertainty yourself is pretty important. This will help you have that kind of serious discussion with your kids. You're trying to educate your child about the difference between anxiety and danger. It's okay to be somewhat anxious, but we need to learn how to manage that. And we need to learn how to avoid danger, but not uncertainty. If you need assistance in how to talk to kids about coronavirus, the CDC has a number of different options and, and uh, resources for you. And I've included some of those in the uh, flyer I sent to the health department. Second question I asked myself was, how can I help reduce anxiety and worry in my child about the current situation? An essential step for parents, grandparents, educators, and adults is to reduce anxiety by holding back on false reassurance with kids. Kids don't need reassurance. They need facts and they need coping strategies to falsely say to kids, everything's fine, don't worry about it, you don't need to think about it, is not helpful to them. But to be realistic and age appropriate in conversation is important. Improvement in kids and their coping abilities is seen when parents stop accommodating to anxiety by reassurance and instead say to kids, let's figure out how we can work this out. Let's figure out what works for you. Let's figure out how we can make this work for us. The key to supporting your child in a healthy way is to understand what anxiety looks like and to recognize it early and to try to redirect it. We want to give kids the skills that they need to recognize and manage anxiety themselves. And it's important to use, kid, to use language that kids understand. How you talk to a kindergartner is going to be very different than how you talk to a junior in high school. Third question I asked myself was, at what age should I talk to my child about coronavirus and other issues? And I think the key to that is, if your kids ask you a question, answer it. They'll let you know when and if they want information. Even kids as young as kindergarten and preschool ask questions about what's happening around them. You're gonna to talk to them in an age appropriate way and in a factual way. Given all the masks and the news that is going on, there's no need to be afraid to talk to kids about their experience and about 
what the mandates are in their school for protecting themselves. Ask your kids what they already know and try to clarify any misinformation they have. Most kids can tolerate conversations of about five to 15 minutes. I wanna remind you that we adults, the more anxious we get, the more we talk and the more muddled the conversation becomes. So be mindful of that, short and sweet, be direct. Another question is, is there anything I should avoid talking to my kids about? And I think, again, it's important to be honest and straightforward. Kids don't need to dwell on death rates and negative stories. That's not what they need to know. And it is important for them to have current news. So if you're gonna watch the news with them, then make sure you're there and you can help interpret the news to them based on their age. Ask them questions about what they think is happening. And I think the last question that I, that I asked myself was, for these kids who have had disappointments since March, no prom, no graduation, not dating, not going out, no swimming pool, no sports, um, many events being canceled and rescheduled, how can I help them manage disappointment? I think the important thing is, again, listen and talk to kids. Don't try to fix their disappointment or suggest a solution to them, but kind of process with them, how can we work through this? How can we make this work for you? What can we do that is helpful to you? How can we remember this event or this circumstance in a way that's meaningful for you? So I think we do need to think about that. Don't make victims out of our kids. There are things that are positive that are coming out of this change in how we live our lives. Families are spending more time together. They're eating meals together. They're spending family activity time together. They're getting to know each other again. And that becomes important. I think another thing that, that I think we have to ask ourselves is, what do I have to be grateful for? What are the lessons that I've learned during this pandemic, during this six months? So, Obviously, it's not always easy to know what's going to happen. Not always easy to know what our next step is. But it is important for us to be mindful of the fact that if we learn how to tolerate uncertainty, we build resilience and we become stronger. So at this point, if people have questions for me or anyone else, I think that, that I'm open to that. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. That was um, very informative and you covered a number of topics, which I think will be important for all the families in our communities to really um, take in and figure out how to um, personalize to their own families. Um, so we will give it a moment. We'll see if any of the media partners on the call have any questions. Um, please type them in now. We'll give it a, a few seconds here before we conclude in case there are any. So we'll give it a minute here. Okay, well, I think you were thorough enough that perhaps they have all their information that they need at this point. Um, you can continue to find any information uh, related to COVID on the Scott and Rock Island County Health Department's website. We will follow up this briefing with a press release with some of the information and the links that Chris mentioned that will be on there. Additionally, this briefing is recorded and will be posted both on the Scott County Health Department's webpage as well as on Facebook. Um, so we encourage you to find any additional information there. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. This is such an important topic. As we know, um, we were talking beforehand about just the uncertainty of how the school year will go. And so families can begin preparing themselves for um, those items that they can't control and those things in life that will be changing quickly. So thank you again for sharing all of that. Thanks for joining us today. And we look forward to talking with you all again soon.